this course is not about new ways of working, although we will talk about those quite a bit in order to understand the implication. It's about new ways of managing. And the term that we used for the book was small a agile management. So we, we thought long and hard, but there was a much distress. Um, should we use the word agile at all? that has all this capital A baggage in the IT industry. And, um, and we decided to, but uh, with a bit of reluctance. So, so we, we talk about agile management and, and so we're trying to create an environment that's faster to change how we work um, by creating agility through increasing the quality, the, the effectiveness, the value of what we do and reducing risk. So this is a huge thing for management, especially middle managers to understand is the reduction in risk. And this is a powerful message we have to get across along with other benefits, blah, blah, blah. But one of the primary benefits from a management point of view is that new ways of working and new ways of managing reduce risk, not increase risk. And that's one of the myths we need to overcome. This reduces risk not increases risk. And we'll talk about that a bit later on in the course. And then the other thing is the profound social ethical underpinning to this. We need to move from value to values. It's not just about the value we deliver to the customer. It's not just about the money we make for the shareholder. It's about the values that we should hold true to ourselves and to our society. And that's where teal culture comes in that we'll talk about. So agility, as I've already mentioned, is about, um, sure, it's about being fast, but it's more about our ability to, to change direction, to pivot, to innovate, to be dis that buzzword, disruptive, uh, to be adaptive to our externalities. So as the world changes, we adapt as quickly as possible as an organization to what's going on and to forge our way through complexity and allow leaders to deal with the complex world that we live in. There's this lovely quote from Charles Lambden, which is, um, cheetahs are faster than gazelles, but less agile. So they have a hard time actually catching them. So a cheetah can outrun a gazelle, but a gazelle can outturn a cheetah. So agility is not about being a cheetah, it's about being gazelle. Agility is about being able to change direction. So what is all this stuff that we're talking about, all this waffle? Um, we characterize it within Till Unicorn, the way we wrap it all up and give it a label. As I say, we were really dodgy about should we use the word agile because it sets people off with all its baggage. So the term that we use generally is we talk about human systems agility. This is our term for all, what are the new ways? What is it we're talking about? We're talking about human systems agility. And it can be seen in all these words that are around us, that surround us at the moment um, when people are talking about work and about society. All these different aspects are, are what we're talking about. We're talking about new ways. So we're not just talking about capital A agile. That's just one small subset of all of these things that you can see on the slide. And all of these things are the different aspects of human systems agility. There's all the things that mean human ways of thinking, and they tend to be states describe different states of of being of feeling of behaving and then systems tend to be things when we think about systems we we we're thinking about the things in our world and agility we're talking about actions or descriptive things describing stuff it's the, the attributes, the nature, the behavior of the world. That's pretty rough. 
grouping, but it did seem to fall out that way. But it's about what, like, what is human work and human society? What is thinking about the systems of work or the systems of society? And what is thinking about the agility, the ability to change in our work? Okay, so we need to understand and think about all of these different aspects. Now, when people look at this stuff, especially when they're cynical, when they are change fatigued, when they have been in conventional organizations for a long time, uh, eyes roll into heads, people go, what a crazy, hairy, hippie. Um, this will never work. Uh, this is bullshit, right? The people's bullshit meters go off. And so the next message that we have to get across to people is that this is not hypothetical. This is not Rob ranting. This is not some guy in California wrote one book and it seems like it might work. This is the new ways. And the new ways are out there already. There are people doing this stuff. Nobody's doing it perfectly. So it's really easy for the cynics to come up with evidence and arguments and and, and anecdotes about how it's not working but this is the consensus of thinking and this is the behavior that is evidencing in many many places around the world many organizations to say this stuff works and in fact not only does it work but when people actually try it it works like hell and it works really easily and it feels good so once people get going on this stuff, it's an easy sell. It's all carrot and no stick. But it's just getting people over that initial disbelief to think that maybe this stuff is possible, is real, is again one of the hurdles that we have to get past. It's not snake oil. It, it, it is genuinely transformation. Oh, I hate that word. Generally advances organizations and it is a powerful way of working. The other fundamental that we need to get across to people is this moral imperative, this idea of social responsibility. And uh, in the short term, I'm very pessimistic about the next 24 months for the world. But in the medium term, I'm very optimistic about the world. And I think that there is a huge shift, the great he going on at the moment with a big transformation in social consciousness where the world is moving up in its in its behavior and its understanding of the world and uh i think we'll come out of the next few years of pain and turmoil as a better society i hope and we're seeing these these movements underway already we're seeing uh a big <coughs> a big attack on shareholder value as a way of thinking in organ in business and 150 uh, us ceos signed a joint letter from the business round table in the us recently to say that organizations should embrace stakeholder value in other words all the stakeholders around the organization not just shareholders uh we're seeing more and more understanding. It's not just about delivering customer value. You've got to understand the values of your customer. The customers are expecting moral organizations. Customers are expecting social responsibility in the organizations that they can consume from. And you see this all the time in the interweb and the hammering that organizations like Facebook are take, taking <coughs> for their moral stance and Twitter and the hammerings that Zoom are taking for their security and things like that, right? So uh, customers expect ethics and morals in the organizations they work with more and more. And, and we expect more at work. So we expect to be able to bring our whole selves to work. And, and the new, the younger generations apparently are more inclined to demand that they be able to bring their whole self to work 
and not have to leave their ethics at the door, not have to leave their beliefs at the door, not have to leave their personality at the door, not have to leave their own social orientations at the door, their ethnicity, their gender, their um, whatever, their mental health at the door that we expect to be able to bring our whole selves. And, and, and so these are huge drivers transforming the moral and ethical frameworks within organizations have to work and managers have to work. And if you really go down the rabbit hole, you get down to understanding that in developed nations around the world now, truth, goodness and beauty have become separated. Science, ethics and aesthetics and art are disconnected. And Asian cultures less so, but you know, the, the developed culture is breaking apart Asian cultures in this regard. And going forward, uh, part of it is about a reunification of truth, beauty and goodness and, and coming back to, to seeing them as different aspects of what we do, of one whole, rather than being quite separate things. At the moment, business is totally oriented around truth. And goodness, bah, greed is good, right? You know, ethics thrown out the window. And beauty and aesthetics get trampled in the pursuit of truth. What are the numbers? What are the results? You know? So uh, Manjit asked about um, virtue signaling and, and, and uh, you know, organizations that are trying to seem to be doing the, wrong, the right things. I don't have a problem with that because one of the ways to transform culture is to do the same behavior 20 something times, right? And then you internalize it. So if organizations are going through rituals of good behavior, not rituals, theater of good behavior, good on them because through that practice, they will actually hopefully start to internalize it. So, you know, let, let's embrace the imperfect. Less and less are we willing to accept the moral compromises that we have to make to work somewhere. And I've written about this in the past that you need to, you know, you're not just following orders when you work at a company that is doing bad stuff. Uh, the, and then forced corporate, corporate ethics programs and, and forced happiness programs, the cult of happiness. You don't get to work here unless you be happy, really. Right, so a lot of this stuff, but this, this is what society experimenting with these new ways. This is society not doing it right, but that's fine because society is imperfect and humans are imperfect and we never do it the right way. And we shouldn't measure against ideal. You're just gonna make yourself sad if you keep measuring the world against perfect because the world is never, ever, 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 ever gonna be perfect. So when we see organizations doing things like you're a cult of happiness. You're going to work at Zappos. You've got to be happy all the time. Uh, we should actually accept that, you know, because at least they're trying and, and they're doing something and they'll learn from the failure and they'll learn from the imperfect imperfection of it. Uh, so I'm cool with all these things, you know, let's not be cynical about them. They're, they're experiments and they're learning and, and we learn through failure, which is something we're going to talk about a lot. Here's, here's this transformation going on in the world when we go right down to the deep ideological stuff then um, there are models out there that if you don't know about you can go and study and they're all summarized on tealunicorn.com at in what new ways of thinking there's an article there that summarizes this slide and it talks about all the different models of thinking which are emerging in society, which are all examples or aspects of new ways of thinking. And more importantly, all of them that I've listed here, not all, but most, many of the models that are out there talk about a phase change, a, a shift, a flip, uh, a, a step change, a paradigm shift, whatever you want to call it, a transformation in social consciousness. There's game A, game B, there's um, 
uh, Claire Graves talking about first tier and second tier levels of culture within the integral model. Um, there's Lalu talking about growing to teal. There's theory X and theory Y as management theory. There's alpha and beta management is another model out there. There's the move from value to values. Even the hippies were onto something when they talked about the dawning of the age of Aquarius, right? This is this, this is the hippie language for the same damn thing, this shift in social consciousness. And this talk about the reunification of science, art, and ethics into the wholeness. So there's there are many models, and many of them were in the cusp of a, a transformation as society at the moment. And so many people don't get this. And so much of the resistance that you strike in organizations is from people who are firmly stuck back in the red and, and maybe not even in the green. And these color codes, some of you will already be aware of from um, the integral model and spiral dynamics sits in the integral model there. It's all on the, on the on the website so i told you you go down the rabbit hole you go deep this is really profound stuff and this is what leads to agile this is what leads to new ways of working and new ways of managing so crazy hippie ranting but like i said um to you before this stuff works, right? And all you need is evidence. All you need is proof points. So the first thing to do in an organization is to understand WDGLL. What does good look like? Go to other organizations. Go to organizations that are working in new ways. They won't be perfect. They will be imperfect but there will exist within, so people who go in with an expectation of perfection will come away cynical. You have to control that. But if we go and look at how other organizations are working, we can see what's better and we can see what works. And this is one organization that I work with. Nobody on this call will know or recognize them, but, um, and boy, are they imperfect, right? So there's some really tragic aspects to their advancement as well. But this is data, right? So this is evidence. This is indisputable numbers about the reality of what happened when they worked in new ways. The, the bar graph shows the number of defects being put into production by production releases. And those huge bar graphs on the left are projects slamming into production. Traditional waterfall projects crashing into production. And the bar graphs on the right are the releases are the defects from a cadenced monthly relief cycle to to put software into production so they cut their defects rate into production their technical debt by a factor of a hundred hundreds and they did it within a month of changing how they work and their cycle time is on a downward trend they're deploying faster and faster and faster so bring data right just a, go to other places, what does good look like? And B, run experiments internally, create proof points, create data, create evidence that says, this is not hypothetical. This works over there and this works, can work here. Look, we tried it, we did this and this was the results. This is, um, this is another one of our clients. So um, this is showing the number of sales in green and the value of sales in blue for a uh, uh, sales oriented organization. And, uh, and it's starting from zero, it's not a chopped or anything. So um, the Vietnamese, so February is a disaster like Christmas is a disaster in Western countries. Um, and, and, they they were pretty flat and and struggling and then we got them working new ways of working and within months the graph took off
Uh, this is another one of our clients where we worked with them to take waste out of their workflows. And so these bar graphs are showing the cost and effort. I can't translate it for you, but they're, they're showing the overheads of doing work and how we got the business processes to be far more efficient to be able to do anything. And again, this was a month's work to optimize the, the workflows. So it's this stuff works, right? And if you want to go and look at a few of our case studies, um, then on the Teal Unicorn website, clients, there's four case studies up there at the moment. I'm working on more. Uh, but you know, we're, we're in the wonderful space of working with clients and seeing this stuff work. It's not hard. It's really not hard. Organizations make it hard. I think that's another message to get across. This stuff is not hard. Organizations make it hard. Eighty percent of our clients in Vietnam are women, and some of our most successful clients in Vietnam are women. And I've thought about this a lot. There's some factors at play there. One of them is that Cherry is a woman, and so they relate to her. And Vietnam is still a very patriarchal culture, and men don't like being told how to work by a woman. But the other th uh, second factor is if you're going to survive in Vietnam as a CEO and uh, as a woman, you have to be smarter and work harder and be better than a man in order to succeed. So some of the sharpest people in Vietnam are women. But the third factor is alpha versus beta. This, this culture, this transformation in society can be described as feminine. And in terms of stereotypical thinking, it doesn't mean it needs to be led by women, but, but the sort of cultures that we men have trained into us from birth, the stereotypical machismo male power and control culture is the culture that's dying. And the stereotypically feminine culture of collaboration, empathy, caring um, is growing. And so it's no wonder that women are drawn and are better at the new ways of working. And for we male, stale and pale, for the old white males, we have a challenge to relearn and reprogram ourselves. And I've done a lot of that. To shed the, the culture that, and I had the advantage that I was never particularly steeped in that culture to start with. But this is part of the transformation. And when you look at the resistance to this, I guarantee you that 80% of the resistance comes from old white males. Guarantee. Or people who have absorbed that culture because it's not it, it's a culture that's common not 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 the individual so i'm going to rattle a bit now but some of the terms that we use then therefore is i will talk about conventional um culture conventional organizations conventional ways of working by conventional i mean centralized power hierarchy command and control state your status comes from your seniority and your power not your mastery of work. Um, we have defined and forced roles and we have demarcation of silos. Some or all of these characteristics define conventional. Similarly, conventional, you know, they're large monolithic product systems, they're bureaucratic organizations, formality. You know, you, you recognize this stuff, right? Many complicated intrusive controls. Wow, slow, difficult change. The organization exists to make it harder to get the work done. This is what I mean when I talk about conventional. I mean, 
what's called Taylorism, scientific management that came in at the start of the 20th century, right? Inhumane management. The idea that we are human resources. We are machines that need to be standardized and made plug compatible, that we need, we are round pegs that will be fit into square roles, that failure is unacceptable, that bravado and heroism are what defines a good employee that you can manage people by numbers, you can measure humans and decide whether they're good humans or not. And that efficiency is achieved by cost cutting shortcuts and low quality. The, some or all of these attributes are characteristics of inhumane management. Another thing that I'll talk about in the course is knowledge workers. And so we've gone from agricultural workers to industrial workers, to clerical workers, to knowledge workers. And knowledge workers have existed all through history, like the Masons are a great example of, of, of knowledge workers. And if you go right back, the Druids are knowledge workers. But the percentage of society that are knowledge workers with the information economy and the service economy, knowledge workers now predominate. And so fundamentally, most of our workers are knowledge workers. And knowledge workers have all these attributes on the slide. You can't, the, the, the key attributes of a knowledge worker is you can't see what they do. It's invisible work. And you can't see what an individual does because knowledge workers work collaboratively. You can only see what the team's doing. So it's almost impossible to measure what an individual knowledge worker is doing or the quality of their work or even their value contribution. Get across that idea. It is impossible to measure the value of an individual worker. And I'm not going to debate that right now, but this is the challenge that we have of knowledge workers. And so therefore, the only way you can get knowledge workers to do what you want to do, you can make a slave do what you want to do by hitting them with a stick. You can't make a knowledge worker. You can't make a knowledge worker. You can only invite and ask a knowledge worker. You can only create an environment where a knowledge worker wants to do the work that you want done. And this is a huge uh, shift for, for managers. And so EQ starts to play a huge role. Thanks, John. And then another distinction that we make really crisp at Teal Unicorn is the distinction between leaders and managers, because the term leader gets abused a lot or, or used in multiple ways. So when we talk about leaders, we are talking, uh, sometimes I'm talking about executives and bosses, but I try not to do that. Sorry, I will slip into that. But we don't mean executives and bosses. I try not to use the word leader for that, but I will accidentally do that because I'm just a habit. But when we talk about leaders, that's a behavior. The people who step up and lead and, and, and say, hey, let's go this way. That's a leader. And then when we talk about managers, we talk about people who have been given a role by the organization to achieve an outcome set for them by the organization. That's a manager. They've been asked by the organization to achieve a specific outcome. All managers are leaders, and not all managers have to be leaders. And I get really grumpy about this thing that all managers need to be great leaders. No, they don't. Managers need to get the job done, given to them by the organization. If there's an intersection between those two groups, but it's not necessarily a, a union. So when we talk about the new ways of working, we're talking about that big slide before with all the words related with human systems agility. But the actual aspects in terms of work uh, this slide here, right? So we group it up that human work is working around people, customer, culture, and trust. Systems work is thinking about transparency, slack, flow, and being data-driven, using science to think about our work. And agility is around understanding complexity, agility, failure, and improvement. 